the world's gonna think he's great. He's gonna look like this savior, this proud eagle. They're not gonna realize he's a vulture. At first, the beast will come with charisma. He will come with deception to ratify a peace treaty with Israel on behalf of the Goy people. It's time to focus on the personification of evil itself in the rise of the beast. We're so glad you've joined us today. This is the fourth stop of our roadmap today. That's to right. Armageddon. Armageddon, yes. It's the rise of the beast, not the Antichrist, but the beast. The beast. Look at you knowing like, the delineation already. Right? Taught I listened to you both. Yes. Oh, <laughs> that's so, wonderful. You know, you, you hear beast, and you think this horned, crazy, scary yeah. person. Is it a person? Is it a is it an animal? It's kind of well, crazy. Well, we want to answer that question, not just the actions this guy takes, uh, but what is he? What's his motivation? What makes the beast tick? Why does he surrender himself over to Satan? Literally, what's the genetic makeup of this creature? And we're going to go into that today. And we're going to go to places even our producer, who's been to Israel 76 times, has never been. It's going to be an amazing episode, guys. Ooh. Let's go there now. Come on, Josh. I know the show today looks a little heavy, but we can lighten it up, make it fun. Oh, we can lighten it up. That's what we can do, brother. Nobody's gonna watch the show. The second you put all the Nephilim floating around in there, they're gonna turn into a different channel. Okay, you know our Bearded Bible Brothers viewers love that stuff. The world is always rooting for the villain, the anti-hero. We need to show them what true evil actually is. Show them what true, Ooh, you talk. Huh? Hey, there's Jeff. Hmm. Yeah, we'll see what he has to say about that. Clear it up, Jeff. Guys, the world's gonna think he's great. He's gonna look like this savior, this proud eagle. They're not gonna realize he's a vulture who only intends to kill its prey before he eats it. Gentlemen, tell us the story, the gory story from the place that is referred to elsewhere as the gates of hell. Of course he did, of course he's on your side. He's always on your side. Well, guys, you heard it from Jeff. It's time to go into all the gory details of the personification of evil itself. We're going to talk about the rise of the beast. Play this episode right before bed. It'll be great. Look, continuity checkers, get out of here. We are tall, we are hairy, we are sweaty, and we are in the middle of Israel, traipsing across the entire country. Some of us had to change shirts. I was smart. I just put this on over my sweaty one. The beast cannot appear until the restrainer, the Holy Spirit, mm. is gone. That's right. That's right. It says that in 2 Thessalonians 2, 6 through 8. Mm -hmm. But how fortuitous of us, brother, that our hotel just so happens to be in this one place of Magdala, Ooh. a story of somebody else who encountered some interesting things. Mm. This one person in scripture here is talked about in Luke 8, 2, and also some woman who had been cured of evil spirits and diseases, Mary, called Magdalene, from whom seven demons had come out. Good for Mary in owning that reputation. I would be proud to tell everybody Yeshua delivered me. But those evil spirits that were cast out of her in the Greek, they're the demons or the demonians. They are not the same as the third fallen angels that follow Lucifer in the rebellion. Those spirit beings do not like to inhabit another thing's body because they have that spirit body. Uh, but these evil spirits are what possess that demoniac in Gadara, just on the other side of the galley right here. Hmm. Guys, to understand the Antichrist, we have to know his origins. Yeah. Where did he come from? To know that, we have to understand the Nephilim. Oh. Now, this is the story of the Benai Elohim that made a bad choice. Came down, yeah. well, they met the daughters of men, and things happened. Yeah. You know what? Let's go on a road trip. I think this story is going to be best explained by seeing a few things. Genesis 6, 1 through 2, and verse 4. Now it came to pass, when men began to multiply on the face of the earth, and the daughters were born to them, that the sons of God, the Benai Elohim, saw the daughters of men, that they were beautiful, and they took wives for themselves of all whom they chose. Verse 4. There were giants Nephilim on the earth in those days, and also afterward, when the sons of God, the Benai Elohim, came into the daughters of men, and they bore children to them, those were the mighty men, Gibberim, who were of old, men of renown. 
Guys, what we endeavor to teach you in a 30-minute program on our Jewish roots, uh, <laughs> this topic is something that for five years now and in dozens of episodes, we have tried to convey this information. So this is going to kind of be a cliff notes. Uh, if you want to get more in-depth with it, then eat it in the high places. Go online and find that yeah. one. But the scripture in Genesis 6, it's baffled many throughout time. Uh, through the interpretation that was well known, mm -hmm. um, anybody in Yeshua's day in the first century AD, uh, by now it, it's different. That's right. Um, you know, back then the Benai Elohim weren't your typical angels. The word angel comes from the Hebrew malach, which simply means messenger. They should more be called spirit beings, you know, who are servants of God. And throughout the Bible, Josh, uh, they were mentioned as stars, and there were specific classes of these spirit creatures, such as cherubim, seraphim, othanim, the Benai Elohim. Well, these sons of God uh, were the highest class that sat upon the Mount of Congregation, ruling with El Elyon, the Most High God. But many of these esteemed beings, which Ezekiel refers to as the stones of fire, chose to rebel and leave their place of habitation following Lucifer, just as he did uh, <laughs> that moment in history where he held the keys to dominion over the earth. So, just, just tell you, man, following Lucifer, bad game plan. That's on there, I wouldn't do it. <laughs> Jude 1, 6-7 And the angels, Benai Elohim, who did not keep their proper domain, but left their own abode, he has reserved in the everlasting chains under darkness for the judgment of the great day. As Sodom and Gomorrah and the cities around them in a similar manner to these have given themselves over to sexual immorality and gone after strange flesh are set forth as an example, suffering the vengeance of eternal fire. In similar manner to these, referencing these spirit beings, these angels, the Benai Elohim, that left their position of power and authority to pursue strange flesh. You see, they committed an unnatural act against their creation, and we see this connection with homosexuality, a unnatural act that is a sin against the intended created purpose for us. Now, these sons of God came down by way of a mountain. Uh, they sat upon a mountain of congregation, as the divine council, but they could not go down that mountain congregation, which base was the Garden of Eden, because two cherubim with flaming swords guarded that path. So they had to find a new mountain passage, a new high place. Now, in scripture, we see that mountains are spiritual as well as physical. And in Ephesians, we read about spiritual wickedness in high places. There's thrones, there's dominions on top of these mountains that these evil rulers uh, rule over earth. So they found a mountain passage, and according to historical documents, Jewish records, it was this mountain behind us. We are at the base of Mount Hermon. You sure this is a good idea to head up here to the gates of hell? All right, all right, here we go. Don't drink Satan's water. I thought I said you could put a water bottle and drink it. No, but science says for souvenir only. It's polluted with like demon germs. Like goats and stuff? Yeah, like dirty goat germs. You don't like taste of goat. I said don't. Psalm 82.1. God has taken his place in the divine council. In the midst of the gods, he holds judgment. Verse six and seven. I said you are gods. You are all sons of the Most High, but you will die like mere mortals. You will fall like every other ruler. It does smell like goat. I can say that much. <sighs> More like, it smells like shawarma goat. Kind of demonic goat. These spirit beings were called gods, mm. sons of Elohim but they rebelled, and the punishment that was sent against the Benai Elohim is chronicled in 2 Peter. 2 Peter 2, 4 says, For if God didn't spare angels when they sinned, but cast them down to Tartarus and committed them to the pits of darkness to be reserved for judgment. Hmm. According to ancient Jewish texts, the Benai Elohim swore an oath on the summit of Mount Hermon to none other than Satan himself, Baal Hermon, Batios, in Lil. And this oath swore that they would follow his plan that no matter the cost, they would pervert the genetics of mankind with their own seed. And this perversion would create hybrids called Nephilim, to which God destroyed them with the flood. But with their bodies destroyed, their spirits became disembodied, wandering spirits on the earth. The demonians in the New Testament, those wandering spirits. But Satan wasn't done there. As a matter of fact, in Genesis 6, 4, yeah. it says there were Nephilim on the earth in those days and after that, after the flood. You see, more Benai Elohim rebelled more of them 
pursued Satan's plan to put their heel on the neck of the woman. But that's okay. There is a prophecy that warned that the seed of a woman would succeed one day in Genesis 3.15. And I will put enmity between you and the woman and between your seed and her seed. He shall bruise your head and you shall bruise his heel. And Yeshua did come, and his heel was bruised through crucifixion by the serpent. But upon his resurrection, he crushed the head of Satan. But before he would go to Jerusalem and perform his final sacrifice, he came here to Caesarea Philippi, also called Banias or Pneus. And it's very interesting, guys, that this was a place of perversion, of sin, of temples to these demon gods, Zeus, Jupiter, and even Pan, this hybrid goat-man god of sexuality, literally the personification of Lucifer in Baphomet. Here we have the gateway of hell, the gateway to the underworld. Mm -hmm. This was Hades, Pan's grotto. What they would do here before when it was massive, this earthquake uh, caved it in. It used to be a much bigger opening, mm. but they would throw a goat or a man and it would, it would drown deep. And if they found blood down the river, that meant Pan had rejected this sacrifice. Mm. Talk about a literal hellhole right there. That's right. But it was here that Yeshua asked his disciples, who do men say that I am? And Peter spoke up and said, you are Hamashiach ben Elohim, the son of the living God. And by that declaration, we were accepted into the family of God to become sons of God and replace those benai Elohim in God's plan. And then Yeshua replied to him saying, Blessed are you, Simon Bar-Jonah, for flesh and blood has not revealed this to you, but my Father who is in heaven. And I also say to you that you are Peter, and on this rock I will build my church, and the gates of Hades shall not prevail against it. story isn't over yet guys. This is about the beast, remember? And we've been following a rabbit trail to discover the identity of this beast as actually being Nephilim. He's a chimera, a mixing of blood, the final result of Satan's grand biogenetic experiment. We know Yeshua came as the last Adam, a perfect human with perfect DNA to save us from the sins of the first Adam. Well, Satan embodies a man in times past. And, and through this man, he took over the world and had perfect dominion. This uh, Antichrist here built himself a tower. And under this tower, he united the entire world under one banner and set himself up as the messenger for the starry hosts who they were going to worship. This man was named Nimrod, which means we shall rebel. And the first on our Jewish roots, we are taking you today to a medieval castle named the Fortress of Nimrod. All right, guys, we're going to get to the whole cool history of the castle and everything. But honestly, who would name their kids We Shall Rebel? Don't touch those cookies, We Shall Rebel. Give me those figs back, We Shall Rebel. Doesn't make any sense. This castle is mind blowing. The fortress you see today was originally rebuilt around 1228 by the Ayyubids under Saladin's son, enlarged by the Mamluks. It was a, a watchtower to spot crusader armies along the Via Maris Highway coming from Damascus. This Muslim crusader era fortress was rebuilt upon a previous fortress, which could date back to even earlier times than archeologists originally perceived. Brother! Whoa. You wouldn't believe what's in there. I bet I would. Oh, you know, I say earlier because some recent archaeological findings have dated this mm. actually back to the Hellenistic age, somewhere around 30 AD. But mm. these giant foundation stones right here, some believe, date back to the time of the Nephilim after the flood, the Canaanite Bronze Age. Now, these are a similar design to Jerash over in Jordan and other megalith cities that we believe were built by giants. Well, from the Egyptian pyramids to Sacsayhuaman in Peru, to standing stones like Stonehenge or Gilgal Rephaim in the Golan Heights not far from here, the ancients chronicled these cities to be built by Nephilim.
Don't get me wrong, being tall is cool until it isn't. That's right, hitting your head on every doorway, not fitting in pants, beds, airplanes, any of it. I can understand why these crazy, dome-shaped, headed, demon hybrid creatures made these wonderful doorways. What does any of this have to do with the beast in Nimrod? Well, not far from here, in northern Lebanon, on the slopes of Mount Hermon, is an ancient city, the ruins of Baalbek. They have tons of temples, ruined temples there. One, the Temple of Jupiter, the largest temple ever constructed, bigger than the one in Athens itself. It was built upon a previous temple, and its foundation were three massive megalith stones. 800 tons each, 19 meters long. And according to the written Ugaric history, Nimrod himself traveled from Assyria. And after he built, you know, Babel, Erek, Akkad, and Nineveh, and he built the city of Baalbek with the assistance of giants. Even this castle is named the Fortress of Nimrod because of the town of Nimrod just a five miles away from here. It's believed that Nimrod died here and is buried somewhere on this mountain. So there we are teaching about God's word and yeah, I thought it was an Ewok. Apparently there's this magical creature known as the yellow belly marmot and it's up here at Nimrod's castle. Makes perfect sense. That's not real. Now, back to Nimrod being the first Antichrist. <laughs> uh, he's inherently linked with the beast, you know, guys, because he was also a Nephilim, a giant. And we can see throughout history that because of a scattering of languages, Nimrod was called by many names, such as Marduk, Osiris, Baal, Zeus, all these different names. So he was the god, the chief pantheon in all of these. And we see in Genesis 10, 8 through 9, and Cush, father Nimrod, he began to be a Gabor in Haaretz, the earth. He was a Gabor, a hunter before Hashem, the Lord. Therefore, it is said, like Nimrod, the Gabor, the hunter before Hashem. Satan and Nimrod were inherently one, and he created a false trinity with Nimrod, his wife Semiramis, and their son Tammuz. So Nimrod was a Gabor, he was a Nephilim. He withstood, he hunted before Adonai, he withstood, hunted in the face of Adonai yeah. against him. Mm -hmm. Okay, he rebelled against God, he hunted God's people. Mm. Orion, the giant hunter in the sky, yeah. Nimrod, right. Gilgamesh, the epic tale, 17 foot tall giant, Nimrod. Nearly every story, nearly everything from the Babylonian era, from the Roman Empire to uh, Egyptian mysticism, yeah. every story he had his fingerprint in. So you may say, how did he become Nephilim if they were destroyed after a flood? Um, there were giants after the flood when the same sins of the Benayah Elohim occurred. Some people think that Semiramis was his mother at first, and she was Nephilim. Other people believe that Satan offered him this covenant, this breach, just like he did to Yeshua, Jesus, that if you bow down and worship me, I will give you all the kingdoms of the earth. I will give you all power and dominion. And thus, he was indwelled by Satan. He became Nephilim, and I even think that he probably drank the blood of Satan to become Nephilim. It's very bizarre. Self, I will never drink Satan's blood. That's the general rule I have. Revelation 13, 1 through 2. Then I stood on the sand of the sea, and I saw a beast rising up out of the sea, having seven heads and ten horns, and on his horns ten crowns, and on his heads a blasphemous name. Now the beast which I saw was like a leopard, his feet were like the feet of a bear, and his mouth like the mouth of a lion. The dragon gave him his power, his throne, and great authority. Although the beast is Nephilim, his human blood side hails from the same uh, Antiochus Epiphanes IV line. He was Syrian Greek and uh, from the Assyrian Empire, actually. We'll discuss more about that next week. But it's interesting that he is actually a Goy. He's not Jewish. Um, he's a mix of all these different nations as Daniel 7 suggests. In Revelation 17, 15, 
says that he is that, that beast that comes out of the waters, the nations. At first, the beast will come with charisma. He will come with deception. He'll ratify a peace treaty with Israel on behalf of the Goy people. For the first three and a half years, he will hunt down the Goy, those who believe in Yeshua, those saints, and he'll behead them. He will probably come as the ninth Imam, Muhammad al-Mahdi, to the Muslim people. But this Antichrist will not get, get the same hold on the earth as he did uh, if through Nimrod. Through Nimrod. Yeah. His, his, his hold will not be as broad set, and even the ten kings that he has, some of them will, will go against him, and God himself will rise up against him and stop it. Yeah. But the moral of this story, guys, is that Mount Hermon connection. Now, many people believe that after Yeshua stayed in the region of Caesarea Philippi for six days, he took his three trusted disciples to him and he ascended to a high mountain. Most people believe it's Mount Hermon because it would be a two-day journey to get to Mount Arbel near the Galilee. And when he went to the top of that Mount Hermon, he was transfigured before them. The reason Yeshua did this was to break the curse that was established by those Benai Elohim where they swore that oath to Satan millennia ago. And he did that for you and for me so that we might have authority over all the works of the enemy. Hey, we know that someday that last Adam, our Messiah Yeshua, will defeat the last Nimrod. I love talking about it. It just fills me. It fills me with energy. As Yeshua said to Peter at Banyas, Matthew 16, 19, the gates of hell would not prevail against them. I will give you the keys of the kingdom of heaven, and whatever you bind on earth will be bound in heaven, and whatever you loose on earth will be loosed in heaven. You know, so, so this kind of bringing it all together, right? Nimrod was the rebel who became the first hybrid and i think what happened is that satan basically possessed him uh for an indefinite amount of time that began a transformation there's something in quantum physics known as quantum entanglement that you can actually uh put two particles so close together that they become entwined with one another and then when you have a change in one there's automatically a change in the other so i actually think that there was a, a quantum entanglement that happened between satan and Nimrod, and that Nimrod became the the living, breathing avatar for Satan. And, and that is where I think we're going to come to the mark of the beast. Mm -hmm. This is where I think, um, you know, Satan has a, a big plan. This is why I called my books Corrupting the Image, because I think his ultimate plan is to remove the image of God, yeah. the, the information of God, that we were created with and replace it with his own information, his own seed. I think that's the big plan. And once that happens, once you're no longer of the seed of Adam and of the seed of God, you're cut off. You can't go. You're, you're cut off. There's no hope. Well, that was a short excerpt from a much longer interview with Dr. Douglas Hamp, and you can see that full interview online. He goes into more details about Nimrod, the beast, Nephilim, uh, stuff that will blow your mind but is scripturally accurate. He is the intellect on that subject, and you're going to want to watch it. I was going to say, a lot of stuff that we didn't hear about growing up in Sunday school. Yes. But we, we hear about it now. Yeah, we didn't get a felt board. Here's yeah. the beast, here's the Antichrist. That's I right. mean, but, but thank you for giving us a concise... Here's who they are. Hmm. Well, because people do have that question. Why do you keep referring to him as the beast instead of the Antichrist? Because mm -hmm. most pastors have, have preached yeah. maybe they're the same thing. If we look at 1 John 2, 18, it says, Little children in the last hour, and as you have heard that the Antichrist is coming, even now many Antichrists have come, by which we know that this is the last hour. Plural, Antichrists, I emphasize yeah. that because it's not a mistake. But, right. but this is the one scripture that people point to where he refers to as the Antichrist. John wrote this, but he also wrote Revelation. And nowhere in Revelation do you see him refer to the beast as the Antichrist. And so you're wondering, who is he talking to? Who's, you know, in context, he's speaking to the Jewish people here about the Antichrist, someone who's going to be Sar Hamashiach to them, this false Messiah. Uh, the beast is the Hayah. He, he's this chimera, but he's a Messiah to the world, to okay, the Goyim. Okay, explain chimera. So, 
a, a mixing of genetic material of, of animals. You know, it, it go, all goes back to uh, Daniel chapter two, this, this uh, dream that Nebuchadnezzar had of all these different nations, all these different pieces uh, stuck together. That's the beast in and of itself and his whole kingdom. Uh, but he's to the goy, to the world, to the Gentiles. But what John is talking about is a Messiah, a false Messiah to the Jewish people. He has to be talking about the false prophet because the false prophet so is going to be false, a Jewish person. False Messiah and the Antichrist. Yes. Yes. So, yeah. so, so the false prophet, I believe, and, and this is, you know, maybe from my own studies, I believe that the Antichrist, according to Scripture, refers to the false prophet. I believe the beast refers to what people have always thought about as the Antichrist. Yes, it's just semantics, but when you start looking into that, it opens up a whole new realm of, of understanding when you look at prophecy. Whoo, that's mm -hmm. a lot. Yeah. There's a little yeah. depth to it. <laughs> there is, but again, you, you said this before, the Holy Spirit can help us learn and Amen. interpret yes. yeah. and and that's why that gift is in us and he's in you so we're Amen. thankful for that yep we'll be right back our resource this week the book what should we think about israel how do you separate fact from fiction in the middle east conflict theologian archaeologist and research author randall price provides objective facts about israel's past present and future Look past the heated debates and discern for yourself what is important to know about Israel and how that affects you today. Contact us and ask for the book, What Should We Think About Israel? We are honored to bring you such valued teaching on the end times, and that comes at a great cost. It costs a lot of money to film in Israel, to take a whole production crew, to have this television set. And I don't know if you've ever noticed, but we don't hold a telethon. We know that our people will support us financially. And for that, we would like to say in Hebrew, toda. Thank you very much. Next week, all about Babylon, yes? Babylon the great, the great horror. Hate to say it, but Ooh. that's what God describes this kingdom of the beast. Mm. Time to go, guys. Unfortunately, it is. Guys, Sha'alu Shalom Yerushalayim. Pray for the peace of Jerusalem. Visit our website, levitt.com, for tour information, broadcast schedule, free monthly newsletter, and online store. Join us right now on our social media sites for exclusive content. Call us anytime at 1-800-WONDERS and ask about this week's resource. Please remember we depend on tax-deductible donations from viewers like you.